Does anyone actually remember Cor Cor Coraline? If you're a fan of stop motion animation, you're probably a fan of Coraline. This movie's grossed nearly $200 million, won multiple movie awards, and is even solely responsible for giving every child in 2009 severe night terrors. <laughs> If you're like me, you probably remember the basics of this movie. The scary mother, the annoying neighbor, the alcoholic circus performer. But what if I told you that even with all of this knowledge, Coraline is even more disturbing than you might think. Choosing to tell a very mature story about neglect, manipulation, escapism, and even death. It's pretty common nowadays for most animated movies to have deeper meanings and hidden themes, but Coraline isn't just another animated movie. Sure, it's primarily aimed at younger audiences, but its mature and dark themes are so prevalent that I'd say after watching this video, you might not ever be able to view this movie the same way again. I'm overreacting here a little bit. It's what I do. But seriously, this movie's actually crazy. So today, I'll be watching the movie Coraline in full while analyzing the good, the bad, and the downright disturbing scenes that make this movie one of the most beloved animated films of all time. So grab your copy of The Death Note and let's watch one of the most misunderstood movies ever, Coraline. Our story begins with what's probably the creepiest credit sequence of all time. We see this random doll being cut open, ripped apart, and completely drained of its insides. Jumping right into it, I guess, okay? <laughs> this doll is completely stripped of everything that makes it unique, and then filled back up and redesigned to look completely different. It's kind of like when you hit the randomize button on a customizable character menu, but then spend two hours changing how they look anyway. Anyway, the weird metal hands that are creating this thing finish up, and then drop it off into the void. I promise this is really important. Oh my god, this is so important. We then cut to a place called the Pink palace apartments. We see two movers bringing some furniture into the house, and they obviously want to be paid accordingly. <laughs> Bro just moved all of that for a single dollar. He's got that SpongeBob SquarePants wage. This is when we cut to our main character, Coraline. And just in case you somehow don't know, Coraline is an 11 year old girl and is described as rebellious, adventurous, snarky, and witty. And honestly, in my opinion, is just kind of a weirdo. She's walking through her oddly shaped backyard while an ominous black cat seems to be following her around. It's implied here that she's trying to find some sort of well somewhere. I wonder what it means. This movie is so cryptic. Eventually, Coraline makes her way to the top of this very creepy looking hill. There, she comes face to face with this cat that we know nothing about, and also there's a Call of Duty jump scare. Let's do this. Nothing to be afraid of because turns out this jump scare is actually a friendly character named YB. He goes on to explain that his unconventional name YB is actually short for Y born, which obviously sounds like he's questioning his own birth. This name might actually be explained in like the novel or something, but this video is about the movie, so I'll just assume YB is extremely sad and depressed. YB explains that the black cat isn't anyone's pet, he just kind of lives around the area. Also, it turns out Coraline is standing right on top of the well. It's surrounded by a circle of mushrooms, which is a cool artistic choice, but also looks like one of those Super Mario games galaxy things where you spin and get a bunch of star bits. <laughs> it could be. She never spins, so we don't know. But jokes aside, YB gives us a little bit of lore on this well that she's standing on. Turns out this well is very mysterious and dangerous. Apparently, it's so deep that if you fell into it and looked up, you would see a sky full of stars in the middle of the day whatever that means. We also find out that YB's grandmother is the one who owns the building Coraline moved into. Although YB is a bit surprised to meet Coraline because apparently his grandma doesn't usually rent the building out to families with children. Cue the ominous music. This is getting spooky. Instead of befriending the only person her age in what's probably a 15 mile radius, Coraline is more of a lone wolf and kind of cold towards YB. She's a little annoyed by him right off the bat. It's probably because he's got goofy looking hair. Oh, I definitely heard someone. Why were you born? Jeez, why is she so mean to him out of nowhere? He just wants to be friends, man. Anyway, it starts raining, so we get the hardest transition of all time and see Coraline now inside her new home. This is when we meet Coraline's parents, who are arguably the most important characters in the movie, at least in my opinion. Her mother, who's a writer, I think, is very neglectful upon a first glance. She's very monotone and very exhausted, and just doesn't seem to care about anything Coraline does or says at all. Also, this might sound weird, but I think it's implied that her mother was involved in some kind of fatal car accident, and that's why they had to move to this new home. If this is explained anywhere, please let me know because I definitely missed it. <laughs> Coraline, I don't have time for you right now. Before Coraline goes to see her father, she's actually given some poorly wrapped item, which apparently some random kid dropped off at their front door. And listen, although she doesn't know it yet, this item will single-handedly change Coraline's life forever. Seriously, this one item impacts the whole story and is the reason this movie even exists. Wait, one sec, I just got a notification. 
I just got a charge for $14.99. I recently found out that I was being charged every month for a service I don't even use anymore. This is where today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. Like I just mentioned, I'm using Rocket Money to cancel all my unwanted subscriptions. If you're like me, you probably have a million of these things, which makes it very hard to manage. Thankfully, Rocket Money safely and securely identifies reoccurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions for you. You can even cancel within the app with just a couple of taps. The best part, you don't need to worry about customer service calls. Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year when you use all of its app's features with over $500 million saved in canceled subscriptions. With all that money saved, you can probably buy a brand new gaming PC. How exciting. But as I mentioned, Rocket Money can do a lot more than just that. It can help you lower your bills simply by uploading a photo of your bill and tapping a few buttons. Rocket Money will negotiate your bills for you from internet service to cable to phone bills. It'll also help you set budgets. If that's your thing, Rocket Money will analyze your spending habits to create a custom budget that works for you and your lifestyle. You can automatically monitor your spending by category and get notifications when you've exceeded your limits. To save more and spend less, join over 5 million members and use Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash Darzy or click the link in the description to get started for free. Back to the video. Coraline opens the package and turns out it's an exact replica doll of herself. Those who have an attention span longer than a single TikTok will remember that this is the same doll that was being made at the beginning of the movie. It's obviously very creepy how this ended up on Coraline's front porch somehow. If I received this, I would definitely destroy it immediately, but that's just me. Moving on, Coraline then goes to see her dad who's got mountains of work to finish, it looks like. This scene is super iconic because of that one screenshot of the dad looking super depressed with a gaming headset on. This is literally me playing a game of Overwatch in 2024, by the way. Dude. The dad is pretty similar to the mother in the sense that he's also kind of neglectful and clearly exhausted. But where he differs, at least in my opinion, is that he seems more genuine than the mom. His neglect feels more about him just being really busy right now as opposed to just not caring about his kid at all. He just feels more sincere to me. He even jokes around with Coraline for a bit. He's just a busy guy, I think. Uh, Who no. needs an alarm system when this you have a door that makes a 90 decibel sound every old. time it moves? The dad tasks Coraline to count all the doors and windows in the house. He's just assigning her a random side quest because he's really busy and like, I don't know, leave him alone, dude. He needs work. So Coraline and her new doll explore the new home for a bit. It's not the cleanest. It's a little old, but at least there's a lot of room for activities. Important thing to note is that there's a picture of a sad boy who just dropped his ice cream. I promise this is important. Just trust me. When Coraline turns around, her doll is gone somehow. It was on the table. She looked away and now it's not there anymore. We get this cool POV shot from the doll, which is not only a cool way of showing us where the doll is before Coraline figures it out, but also it's a really good way to make the shot look very eerie and make the viewer feel uneasy, almost like there's something more going on with this doll. Our very first movie goof comes when Coraline drops her notepad. We can clearly see the wires holding it up in these frames. It doesn't ruin the shot or anything, I just thought it was funny. Anyway, Coraline finds the doll, which leads to her pushing a box out of the way, thus revealing the outline of a small door behind her drywall. Coraline, being very curious and probably a little ADHD, basically yells at her mom until she's forced to come check it out. The mom doesn't really care, but agrees that she'll open the door if Coraline stops being very annoying. How motherly. She opens this drawer full of keys and somehow finds the correct one right away. I understand the key looks very different than all the other keys, but like, no hesitation. She basically just like speedruns this thing. She finds it right away. The mother is then completely fine with ripping her own drywall and opening the door. Coraline seems a little disappointed, and that's because the door literally leads nowhere. Good job, mom. You ripped your wall for nothing. Why is the door so small? We made a deal. Zip it. I get the feeling that this mom we just shouldn't have had a child. Mom. Like, get a cat or something next time. Later that night, the family is having dinner together. The food looks really bad, and Coraline looks very disgusted. She doesn't want to eat the food at all, so she just heads to bed. Important to note here that Coraline actually has some kind of rash on her hand. She must have gotten it earlier when she played with all those mushrooms. I know this seems like a lot of information to take in at the very beginning of the movie, but there's a lot of foreshadowing in this movie, so just deal with it for now. And here's when we get movie goof number two. When Coraline reaches for the picture of her friends, this is how it looks. But when she looks at it close up, this is how it looks. The three from 7.30 and the word Coraline are missing or replaced for some reason. Who cares about continuity anyway? Am I right? Coraline heads to bed and then wakes up in the middle of the night. This part is a little weird, so bear with me. Coraline notices a mouse under her bed. The mouse runs out of her room, so naturally she decides to follow it. The mouse waits for her around every corner, almost like it's trying to lead her somewhere. And eventually it does because it squeezes through the small door from earlier. But instead of being a brick wall, this time it actually ends up being the very iconic, very colorful tunnel. I'm sure everyone's seen this tunnel before. It's literal, it's symbolic, it's a fun time. Coraline obviously decides to crawl through it. It kind of reminds me of those things 
things dogs run through in competitions. Maybe that's what they see. I don't know. I'm not a dog. Once Coraline gets to the other side, she realizes she's right back where she started in her home, except a couple of things are a little different. Most notably, it's a lot cleaner. The packing boxes are all gone. And also the painting of the sad boy from earlier is actually happy now. It's almost like this is a second version of her original house that's just way better in every way. This is when Coraline makes her way to the kitchen to find her mother cooking some food. And big time scary alert. If you've never seen this movie before, this is usually around the time people really start feeling creeped out. Coraline's mom turns around and has a big smile, buttons for eyes, and perhaps even scarier, a turtleneck sweater. Ah! No, but seriously, this is obviously terrifying. It's really creepy looking, and the way the mom's acting makes this whole moment feel very disturbing for some reason. You're just in time for supper, dear. This is so creepy. It's not even you that scary. Not it just makes me anxious. The mom explains that she's not exactly Coraline's mom at all, but actually a different version of her mom altogether. She calls herself the other mother. This is her name now. That's what I'm calling her. She asks Coraline to go get her father, which is when she goes to his office. And instead of it being filled with boxes and work, her father's actually playing music and just seems a lot happier. He also has buttons for eyes. I'm guessing his name is Other Father. That sounds about right. He improvs a whole song about Coraline and how she's cute or something. I obviously can't play the whole song here in this video, because if I do, YouTube will send the armed forces to my address and destroy my PC. But you can probably find it here on YouTube somewhere. It's not that long. It's just super iconic and the dad is kind of goaded, so I'll shout it out. Movie goof number three, maybe, is when the dad hits himself in the head and for a couple frames, you can see his head detach from his body. How silly. I'm assuming this wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> and actually, I want to take that moment to kind of appreciate how cool this movie actually is. It's done in the style of stop motion animation, which takes forever and is super tedious, so plus respect on that one. Also, this movie was directed by Henry Selleck and not Tim Burton. I find there's a misconception for some reason that every creepy stop motion movie is directed by Tim Burton. Everyone I know thinks that he directed this movie for some reason. Tim Burton's actually only directed two stop motion movies before, so I'm not sure why people think this, but yeah. Anyway, back to the movie. Everything is great in this weird alternate reality. The parents are actually nice and the food is actually tasty. After eating, the other mother explains that they've been waiting for Coraline to arrive for some time now. According to her, every child has a set of other parents and some even love their child more than the original parents. Basically, everything that made Coraline's world boring is a lot cooler and more interesting here. Surprisingly, Coraline doesn't really seem to fall for the bait, actually, so she asks to go back home. I'm assuming she can sense the murderous vibes this lady with the button eyes is giving off. So Coraline's about to leave, but before she does, the other mother slathers some mud on her hand rash. Coraline falls asleep in her other home. She wakes up back in her real home, and then to her surprise, the hand rash she had is completely gone. Sadly, though, once Coraline wakes up, she realizes that the tunnel of the other home is also completely gone. So what is it? A dream? Is Coraline going insane? Coraline tells her parents about her experience, but of course they don't believe her, and instead she's tasked to bring a bunch of mail to her upstairs neighbor. And I'll be honest, I don't really get this guy at all, so if I struggle to explain this next part, please correct me. Coraline goes upstairs and meets her neighbor who's named Mr. Bobinski. This guy is a Russian who owns a mice circus. Everyone either thinks he's crazy or drunk, and for some reason he has blue skin. Other than the mouse connection from earlier, I don't know why this character exists at all, to be honest. But it's all bricked up. <laughs> My brain is so cooked, bro. How has no one used that as a reaction meme on Twitter or something? What a crazy line, dude. Coraline then goes to visit her downstairs neighbors as well. It's these two old women who can see the future, or at least claim to. I know a lot of people are gonna get mad at me here too, but like this scene also doesn't really matter, I think. This movie has so much going on in the background, countless theories and hidden messages. It's kind of impossible for me to cover all of it, I'll be honest. I'll talk more about that at the very end of the video, okay? But for now, I'll just keep the movie going. The ladies quickly read Coraline's future, Harry Potter style. One of the ladies sees a hand, the other lady sees a giraffe or something. This part is kind of cool, try to remember it for later. And then later that day, it's really foggy for some reason. Coraline and YB are kind of hanging out. YB explains that his grandmother doesn't let him go inside the Pink Palace apartments because she's convinced it's cursed. He goes on to explain that his grandmother had a twin sister, but when they were very young, her twin went missing. It's extremely creepy and something is clearly going on here. And movie goof number four is when YB asks Coraline to take his picture. She does exactly that, and when she does, there's a flash that goes off. The problem with this is that there's no flash attached to the camera at all, and the specific camera she used is called the Leica M3, I hope I'm saying that right, and it has no built-in flash at all. Yes, I think that's a very silly oversight, and no, I don't think anyone cares. Skipping ahead to later that night, and Coraline is woken up by some mice again. She follows them to the tunnel, and this time it's actually there. Coraline is kind of excited because she hasn't eaten an actual meal since the last time she visited the other world. She finds her other mother cooking more food, and everything seems relatively normal. So thoughtful of you to send this nice cheddar, Coraline. 
cheddar? She cooked it! Did she just pan fry the mice? That that's crazy. Okay. After a bit, Coraline goes off to find her other father. He plays her music again because that's basically all he does. Later, she's eating more food and then the other YB actually shows up. I'm pretty sure it's the first time we see this guy. Like everyone else in this world, he has buttons for eyes. But here, YB also just doesn't talk. The way this is revealed is actually really creepy and makes you think that there's something sinister going on. I thought you'd like him more if he spoke a little less. So I fixed him. The two end up going to one of Mr. Blobinski's mice circus performance things. The whole thing is really cool and probably took ages to film, but honestly, I don't know if any of it really matters at all. Just try to remember that it happened, I guess. Coraline then goes back to her normal world again. I guess she could just go back and forth whenever the tunnel's there anytime. She goes shopping with her real mom and wants to get some gloves, but because this mom is boring and a vibe killer, she says no. Also, I can't stress how bad the food looks in this world. Like, who keeps meat unpackaged like that in the fridge? At least put it in a Ziploc bag or something. <laughs> Come on. A bit later and her mom and dad are out of the house, so Coraline checks the door again and turns out the tunnel is there because, you know, it just is. Maybe it's on a timer or something and you just have to get really lucky. When Coraline enters the other world, she's greeted with a bunch of new clothes, so obviously we're left to assume that the other mother is probably always watching. This is when Coraline runs into the black cat that's been super mysterious this entire time. In this other world, he can actually talk and he's got one hell of a voice. I won't lie. How can you talk? I just can. This movie's pretty vague and indirect about this, but I'm pretty sure the cat can just teleport whenever and wherever he wants. And also he can TP in between worlds, I think. He's probably got a mod menu or something. There's no way he doesn't. The cat gets distracted and leaves for a bit, which gives Coraline some time to watch this theater play from his downstairs neighbors. I'm not gonna show too much of this scene here because again, I think it's really cool visual stuff. I just don't think it like furthers the plot in any real way. I feel like some people are gonna hate me for that, but whatever. Just know that she went there. That's all that's really important. Also, I'm kind of scared to show this scene because it's a little revealing. <laughs> You smell like the fishes. Oh god, I forgot about how these characters looked. Very interesting art direction. Essential for the plot. And this is when this movie's positive charm takes a turn. Things have been pretty creepy here and there, almost teasing something deeper. But now is the time when Coraline gets truly disturbing. Coraline sits down with her other parents, a smile on her face because this other world is seemingly perfect. Before dinner is served, her mother brings forward a tiny box as a gift for Coraline. Coraline opens it to reveal two black buttons, a needle, and some thread. Coraline's smile washes away as she realizes what she's being asked to do. The other mother wants her to sew buttons into her eyes so she can stay in this world forever. This is like when you get an ad for a mobile game that looks fun, but then when you download it, it's just some boring town builder or something. There's the catch. There's always a catch. Coraline has a super valid reaction to all of this and declines while also being extremely terrified. The mother tries to gaslight her into doing it, but it fails. Coraline tries to escape this other world and go back to her real home, but it fails. Eventually, Coraline runs away from the house only to end up in this weird white area. The black cat shows up and explains that this is the part of the other world that just doesn't exist. He seems to know what's going on here. I wish you would have told Coraline a lot sooner. <laughs> he explains that the other mother is not what she claims to be and that everything in this world has been fabricated by the other mother to trick Coraline into staying. Coraline is led back to the house where she runs into the other mother in a room full of giant bugs. I'm sure this symbolizes something really cool or deep or important or something. But then Coraline and the other mother get into an argument because Coraline wants to leave, but this is when the other mother reveals her true form. Turns out the other mother isn't a version of Coraline's mom at all, but actually she's this giant spider-like monster and she's actually called the Beldum. Who saw that coming? I bet you wish you had a death note now, Coraline. The Beldum is very evil and wants to trap Coraline here forever. She puts her into a mirror. In this mirror, Coraline finds three other children who are dead. Jeez, this is getting dark. We find out that the Beldum has been spying on Coraline this entire time through the eyes of the doll she's been carrying around. If you look closely, actually, the Beldum was the one who made the doll in the opening shot. I like how they revealed this big twist at the very beginning of the movie. It's just the viewers didn't really understand it yet. It's really cool. I like it. The three ghost children are all previous victims of the Beldum, one of which is actually the twin sister of YB's grandmother all that time ago, so that's cool, I think. They explain that Coraline must find all three sets of eyes the Beldum is hidden around the area. Once Coraline gets them, the children will be free, and so will Coraline. I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but f*** it. Cool concept. Coraline escapes the mirror thanks to YB, who's friendly in this world now. Thanks to him, she's able to crawl back through the tunnel and head back to her normal home. And you'd think everything would just be good to go here. Like, just don't go back through the tunnel. We're good. But of course, it's never that easy. That's because you're 
crazy. <laughs> I love their dynamic so much, dude. YB is so good in this movie, even if he does act like a weirdo 99% of the time. Coraline realizes that both of her real parents are actually missing. She has no idea where they could be. So the black cat leads her to the mirror in her world, where we see both her mom and dad stuck in there, freezing to death. How did they get in there? Why is it so cold inside? Did the Beldum cross over to this world or something? Answers we may never know. Coraline is convinced that she has to find the real eyes of the missing children to save them, so she heads back into the other world, which is basically a death sentence, I'm not gonna lie. She runs into the Beldum immediately, and this entire interaction is a little weird. I thought the Beldum wanted to eat Coraline, but then when she sees her, she's like all nice and wants to be a mom, so like, is she an evil monster or just very lonely? Either way, this is very tragic. Coraline mentions playing a game because apparently the Beldum loves playing games. I heard she already finished her battle pass and it just came out, she's actually addicted. The game is that Coraline has a couple hours to find all the eyes and her parents. If she does, everyone is free, and if she doesn't, she gets button eyes herself, which I hear is very bad for your vision. The Beldum accepts for some reason, and we get one of the hardest moments in this entire movie. <laughs> it's a deal. <gasps> That's so cool. I love that moment so much. She just like disappears, but it keeps going. I love that. Thanks to a clue from the Beldum, Coraline finds out each set of child eyes are hidden within one of the wonders that has been created in this area, whatever that means. Coraline checks the backyard. She finds the first set of eyes pretty easy. The other father is low-key helping her out. Turns out he was being controlled by the Beldum this entire time, so none of this was actually his fault. I forgot to mention this earlier, but in the real world, Coraline got some special looking glass from her downstairs psychic neighbors. At the time, they played off like it might work, but it might not. Of course, it actually ends up being the single most important item in this entire movie, but whatever. It leads her directly towards the set of eyes, so that's nice. Two more sets of eyes to go now. Coraline enters the theater from earlier because she went there, remember? There, Coraline finds an eye being held by the other neighbors. This is when we get the movie's only real jump scare, to be honest. There's some shenanigans, but Coraline does just end up getting a good grip and taking the eye. Only one eye left to go, which is when she heads to the mice circus upstairs. But get this, Coraline fails, and this entire area still doesn't seem to matter at all. <laughs> she does fail grabbing the eye, but a bit later, as time is about to run out, the black cat kills a mouse outside of the house, which just so happened to have the final eye in its mouth, I think. Black cat OP, please nerf him in the next update, seriously. This is when we get movie goof number five, when the world is breaking apart. If you pause on this frame right here, there's seems to be no steps to the upstairs circus, but in the very, very next shot, the steps do appear behind Coraline. Very unfortunate mistake. Someone screwed up. The Beldum is somehow even uglier now, and all Coraline has to do is find her parents. What's funny is that she finds her parents almost right away. Turns out they were just trapped in a snow globe, which is why they were cold, I guess. Coraline knows by this point that the Beldum doesn't play fair, and no matter what, she's probably dead. So in a last-ditch effort to survive, she throws her cat towards the Beldum, takes the snow globe, and attempts to escape. The cat rips off the Beldum's eyes so she can't see now. Sadly, this makes the Beldum even angrier and spawn in a giant spider web thing. This part is actually super scary. Like, the whole tone of this movie is completely shifted by this point. Coraline is stuck in this spider web thing. She's getting chased. It's exactly like Dead by Daylight. It's very fast paced. This is when Coraline, with help from the ghost children, is able to get to the tunnel and escape, but not before cutting off one of the Beldum's hands. Coraline's on the other side now. Everything seems oddly okay. Her parents are back and don't seem to recall anything that's happened at all. Although they are a bit happier now, I guess, which is nice. Maybe the Beldum was like like sucking their happiness or something. Later that night, Coraline has a dream about how the Beldum isn't gone yet. So, and I'm not kidding here, she heads to the well from the very beginning of the movie. The evil Beldum hand follows her there. And thanks to help from YB randomly showing up, the hand gets trapped in the well forever. Thus, the day is saved and hopefully no more children will be victim to this evil monster. The next day, we see all the neighbors having a good time in the backyard. Everyone is here seemingly very happy. The camera zooms out and the backyard looks a little like the Beldum's face, kind of. At least me, it does. We see the cat who teleports away, and then that's just kind of the end of the movie. And that was the entire movie. Coraline. Was it an absolute banger? Honestly, this movie kind of confused me a lot. Like, I'm not 100% on anything in this movie, but I still ended up enjoying it, I won't lie. It's very disturbing at times. It's very scary and kind of psycho. It's not at all what I expected from what was labeled a kid's movie back in the day. The constant foreshadowing was really cool and unique. I'll give it that. The future reading was accurate on both sides, turns out. Looks like a hand for the Beldum, and it kind of looks like a giraffe, which could be interpreted as the Beldum as well. At first glance, the intro sequence seems to be some filler animation, but 
turns out we're literally seeing the doll being made that kicked off everything. I know this movie is subject to countless theories and explanations because it's so complex at times. I like the theory that the real mother is actually also the other mother because she literally handed Coraline the doll in the first place. She also kind of enables Coraline going through the tunnel a couple times, but that's just like harmless fun that people made up. It's not really that deep. My only real criticism is like the Beldum isn't expanded on as much as she probably should be. The ending kind of feels rushed to me. We like see her, she goes blind, and then we don't see her ever again. It's a little weird. I don't know. But yeah, that's the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and comment. It helps out a bunch. Become a member for only a single dollar. It gets your name at the end of all my future videos here. Shout out to all my current members. I appreciate you all so much. Seriously, thank you. I, I don't know what to say. Just thank you so much. We got way more banger content coming out for Halloween. Paula Abdul scores this one a solid scary spider lady out of five. And yeah, thanks for watching. I just can.